What happens to Paul in Jerusalem? That's what we're going to find out in Acts 21. Well, now we saw Paul leave Macedonia, Turkey, and go to Jerusalem. So they sent sail and they landed in Tyre, which is going to be that place in that Phoenician land. It's Syria, but it's the northern part of the land and it is a major seaport. So they came off and it said that they stayed there for a couple of days. And it says through the spirit, they were telling Paul, the people who were, don't go to Jerusalem. I don't think that means the Holy Spirit was saying, don't go to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit was telling them what was going to happen to Paul. And they themselves in their hearts said, don't go to Jerusalem. It's going to be bad news. And even Paul had been warned about the fact that there was going to be prison and hardship. And they just, um, you know, they had such a heart for him. They cared for him so much. It's funny because I get the impression, you know, you just read Paul the very a serious, studied kind of man, but everyone loved him. I mean, when he tells people he's not going to see him, they cry, they beg him not to put himself into danger. It's the kind of love a real leader gives to people. And so it wasn't so much that they were shown by the Holy Spirit a false image, but they made the wrong conclusion. It's going to be tough. Don't go. But Paul's like, nope, I have to go. So they ended up going to Sidaria and came to the house of Philip the Evangelist. This was going to be some 25 years after Philip ran into the eunuch from Ethiopia and baptized him. 25 years now. Now he has four unmarried daughters who all prophesy. And they stayed with Philip for a couple of days, many days it says. And this is a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Again, probably because it's down in elevation took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands with it, and says, this is what's going to happen to whoever owns this belt. And then this is the Jews in Jerusalem. They're going to bind the man and deliver him to the Gentiles. And when it says, we heard it, because Luke is writing this, so it means Luke, when all of them heard this, they said, you know, don't go, don't go to Jerusalem. And Paul said, why are you doing this, weeping and breaking my heart? See, he's got a soft heart. He's a little softy in there. Maybe it's like an Oreo cookie where he's hard on the outside, but soft and gooey on the inside. And, okay, that's my bad analogy for today. I'm not ready to be imprisoned. I don't want to die, but let the Lord's will be done. I think in all of it, when Jesus talked to follow him, and that in every case, we should want the Lord's will to be done, even if it's not something we want it to happen. And he was taking that very seriously. So they went to Jerusalem and the disciples from Caesarea came with and stayed at someone's house who was from Cyprus. Boy, he's a long way from home, but he says he was an early disciple. Paul then goes and visits James. This is going to be the brother of Jesus, who is now in charge of the church in Jerusalem. Church being a people, not a building and made it in time for the Festival of Pentecost. Paul told him all the things that was going on, told him the details of all the ministry that he had done among the Gentiles and all the places he traveled. He says he related them one by one. That's going to be a long, long story because Paul went a lot of places. And it says when they heard it, they're glorified, they glorified God. And it says, and I love this quote, how many thousands there were among the Jews who believed, and but they were zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to, you know, give up on Moses, give up on the law, telling them not to circumcise their children, not to walk in the customs of the Jewish people. And they're going to hear about this. And that wasn't, I don't think, what Paul was saying at all. In fact, it was James that said, you know, don't trouble the Gentiles to be circumcised. But in some cases, Paul did so with Timothy so that he could preach to Jewish people. I don't think there's any problem with doing these things if you want to do these things. If I want to celebrate Passover and recognize Jesus inside the Passover, that's fine. But I'm not going to make you celebrate Passover. So if you want to do it, do it. That's fine. And if you don't want to do it, that's okay too. You don't have to do it. I don't think Paul was telling him not to do it, but many Jewish people maybe walked away from it. You know, if you told me as a kid, if you become a Christian, you don't have to do the Sabbath thing, I would have stopped doing it instantly. 
when I became a Christian, and I did, because I didn't enjoy that particular piece of it. So Paul wasn't telling people not to do things. He was probably telling people you don't to do things. It is not part of your salvation to do all the Jewish things. And we saw that all along. How many times Jesus talked to people about Sabbath or washing or the ritual washing and not paying attention to what was going on in the heart. Again, I think this is the new wineskin. And if you want to go ahead and do older things, that's fine. If you want to follow the traditions, that's fine. We even saw that Paul didn't shave his head because he had also taken a vow. So he wasn't walking away from it. It's just a matter of, must you do it? Is your salvation based on it? So I think this is a false claim, even though you don't have to do exactly all the things. You don't have to do these things if you don't wish to do them. But I think that the what James is saying is these rumors are putting everyone under scrutiny and putting yourself under scrutiny. So what can we do? We have four men as part of the believers who have taken a vow, just like Paul took a vow. And it says, you know, why don't you take these men and purify yourself along with them, pay their expenses so they can shave their head, ending their vow time. And then people will know that you're not against the observance of the law. And so Paul did it. He went with them. He purified himself along with them, which probably was ritual bathing, paid for their hair cutting, went to the temple. And it says that, that the offering was presented for each one of the men. And so in the commentaries, it was kind of interesting because I heard completely opposite views from people. Well, he wasn't really doing that. And I believe he wasn't. I think he was trying to say exactly what I said. You don't need it for salvation. Jesus doesn't insist that you do it. But if you do it and you find it fulfilling, if you find it brings you closer to God, then great, do it. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And another commentary said, oh, that's exactly what Paul was doing. Paul Paul was telling them they don't have to do any of these things. So they would be right in what they were saying. But I think it's a finer line than that. I think it's exactly what it sounds like. If people were saying you need this to be saved, Paul would fight against it. But if they're saying it's fulfilling to me. I would love to take this vow. Obviously, Paul found some benefit in taking the vow. He found some benefit in circumcising Timothy. But don't go too far and say that anything is depending on it. Like I said, I want to do Passover seders. That's more for a thing like me. If you want to do Sabbath, go ahead. But again, Jesus is not demanding it from us. And it's not something that we must do. So I don't find any problem with this. It was funny. I read a lot of different things trying to kind of get where we were going with all of this. So it said then that when the seven days were complete, the Jews from Turkey saw him in the temple. And then they started crying out, stirring up a crowd, called for help even. And it says, this is a guy who's been teaching everywhere and going into Greek temples. And he brought Greeks into the temple and defiled the holy place because outsiders were not allowed to come in. We've seen them in all these other cities like Ephesus. There were even big signs out there that says that there's a court of the Gentiles. That's where the Gentiles are supposed to go, but they're not supposed to go into the temple. So it was clearly marked. And so Chancellor Paul didn't do that at all. He probably left the Greeks in the court of the Gentile area and just, you know, left them there. But Maybe that this was confusing the four men who had taken the vow as the four men who were Greek who were also seen with him. So they were looking for the bad in him, right? We saw that with Jesus, that we heard something he would say, we take it out of context, and we would say, this is what he meant by it. So again, happening again, they saw him with four people and they just assumed those were Greeks and they ended up seizing him, dragging him out of the temple. Once the gates, it says, were shut, they, they wanted to kill him. And it said that there was confusion in Jerusalem. There was a hubbub again. So it's interesting that they cared about the hubbub. They cared about the Greeks being in the temple area, but they wanted to kill Paul, which was also against the rules. So it was against the Roman rules. It was against the rules of God. He didn't care. So he ran over, it says, to the soldiers and the centurions. And when they saw that the soldiers were there, they stopped beating Paul. And the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered and put him in chains again and asked him, you know, who are you and what did you do? Why are people shouting at each other? Why is there chaos? Remember, Romans don't like chaos. So what is going on? And so they brought him into the barracks 
And he came to the steps and had to actually be carried by the soldiers because everyone was so violent in that crowd, they were just going to kill him. So they actually tried to protect him by carrying him to these barracks. Uh, I was in Jerusalem after a celebration of a different religion's holy day, and there was a part where they let out, and it was so crowded with people that I couldn't even um, touch my feet on the ground. I was being carried by the entire swarm of people out of the building. I couldn't have moved if I wanted to. And probably if I tried to wriggle away or get away from this area, I probably would have fallen and been trampled. So when you have a mob going and crowds going, it's not quite so easy to get away or, I don't know, escape the whole situation. They're actually kind of scary, to be honest with you. So the troops themselves were in a building, and you can see it today. It's called Antonia Tower. This would have been the same place at the time of Jesus as well. But this is where the barracks were, and so they probably brought him over into that area. And there was also a um, jail cell inside of the Antonio Tower as well. They brought him in, and the tribune said to him, I want to talk to you. Do, you. do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who recently stirred up the revolt and led 4,000 men of assassins into the wilderness? This was something that actually happened. Josephus wrote about it in 54 AD, where an Egyptian led a revolt of the Sakare, which they were um, dagger people. And people were killed. The Romans squashed it, and the leader escaped into the desert. So we kind of have a time frame about what this happened. But they're like, are you that guy who stirred up all this trouble and had the Sakari out in the desert? And Paul says, you know, I'm a Jew. I'm from Tarsus in Sicily. I'm a citizen, a Roman citizen of no obscure city, meaning a very prominent city. And I want you to let me speak to the people. The tribune gave him permission. He stood on the steps and motioned with his hands like, I'm going to say something now. And he addressed everybody in the Hebrew language. Boy, cliffhanger. Now that ends Acts 21. What I'm going to meditate on is how people will see something going into danger and warn us not to do the dangerous thing, not to speak when it is dangerous, not to say things when it is dangerous. And the fact that when you do say something, no one's going to take it for what it is, right? Jesus said something and they would take it out of content. Well, you know, if you tear down this temple, it's going to be built back in three days, meaning his body. Or the temple is going to be destroyed, not by him, but just in the future. And they said, see, he's going to destroy the temple. People who are against you are always going to take the worst take of everything you say. But that doesn't mean you don't say it. That doesn't mean that you don't become bold. But you can see in this case, too, when there's a sensitive issue and there's nothing against it, Paul went with the man who took the vow. He could have been obstinate. He could have stood firm on this whole thing and said, nope, you don't have to do any of that. I'm not doing this thing. But he saw a moment where he could get back to a point where he could talk to Jewish people again and give them the message of Christ. So he did it. So he's not fighting for the sake of fighting, but he's also standing firm where he needs to stand firm. And what I'm going to pray about is that discernment that Paul has so that you know when you should take a softer bent to things or when you should stand firm. But either way, you always tell the truth of Christ. You never back down from that. And even when there's a mob coming for you, you don't change your message. And I'm going to pray for that kind of strength. And what I'm going to tell other people is that same idea that we should always be bold, that we should always tell the truth of God. And even in the face of great danger, that doesn't mean we should shrink. That doesn't mean we shouldn't go to Jerusalem. Well, the figurative Jerusalem. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do the thing we're supposed to do. And sometimes our path is going to be filled with danger. But make sure it's the right path. Sometimes people look at this and will, oh, I don't know, do something political or do something that doesn't have anything to do with God, doesn't have anything to do with the Bible, Scripture. And they say, well, you know what? I was told to be bold. Well, yeah, you should be bold, but be bold for the Scripture and be bold for God. These things of earth, they're not worth putting your neck out for in general. But the gospel, the truth of the Bible, the words of Jesus, the words of Paul, absolutely. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com and I would love to hear how this is going for you. Thanks so much for listening and have a great day.